Welcome to the third episode of Armory, the show where we explore the lore behind an army's miniatures. Tonight we take a look at the bioforms of the Great Devourer, the endless hordes of void-faring monsters that make up the Tyranid Swarm. From the relatively small Ripper, whose swarms strip down the fallen worlds of biomass, to the enormous Hierophant Biotitan, and from the Custodus eating Norn Emissary to everyone's favorite beatstick. This Xenos breed features a wide variety of Lovecraftian inspired monstrosities, and tonight we will go through all of them. I have roughly ordered them by size, so we are starting off with everyone's favorite chomping doggo, the Ripper Swarm. When a planet's biomass has to be gathered quickly, or when the Nids want to gather biomass during a prolonged period of combat, they employ Rippers. These terror worms have but one purpose, which is to find and eat anything that is even remotely edible. They will eat fallen Tyranids, enemy corpses, natural biomass, and when that runs out, they will even coordinate with other Rippers to tear down larger targets. After gorging themselves, they will return to the reclamation pools so the biomass can be reassembled into the swarm. Since they are all stomach and teeth, they actually lack the brain capacity to function outside of synapse range, causing them to literally drop dead when they are moved away from the swarm. On some occasions, the Norn Queen may also order some of them to burrow and slowly morph into other Tyranid bioforms, a function which can be used to surprise reinforcements or to seed conquered planets in the case anyone tries to recolonize it. Norn Queens have also been known to modify the standard Ripper bioform for some more specialized purposes. The most common of these mutant forms are the Sky Slashers. These Rippers have been granted wings to increase their mobility and maneuverability. They have also been used to soak up anti-air fire so the larger Tyranid bioforms can safely reach their destination. Unfortunately, during the big model cull of 9th edition, these models have also been removed from their range, so you will have a hard time finding models for them. Other forms also exist, such as the eel-like Rippers, which have been granted fins for the retrieval of biomass from aquatic planets, but yeah, also no models available for these. Spores also form an essential component of the Tyranid bio range, functioning as living bombs for zoning purposes, turning the atmosphere into an acidic deluge, or simply functioning as a rapid transport. Spore mines are probably the most common strain, and they come in a wide variety, ranging from metal-covered frag spores that shoot metallic chitin shards when they explode, basically like an imperial frag grenade, to the poison spore mines that douse their targets in flesh-eating phages and all sorts of toxins. The Nits use these spores in a multitude of ways, shooting them with other bioforms to be used as living artillery shells, seeding them in contested territory to act as a nasty surprise for the enemy, or simply raining them down from orbit and watching chaos ensue. The spores themselves aren't really sentient, but they do possess rudimentary sensory organs that allow them to detect nearby heat and movement. When they sense a non-synaptic creature nearby, they will combust and send out a signal to other nearby spores. This will cause a chain reaction during which all nearby spores will detonate, generally resulting in a complete erasure of whatever was unfortunate enough to come close enough to these party balloons. Mucolid spores are similar in many ways to these spore mines, but these guys got some chunk. Bigger and better than their driftloon looking cousins, these fuckers have evolved into some driftloom shit. Mucoloid spores act as anti-air mines that patrol the skies and surprisingly quickly drift towards enemy aircraft. Once they reach their target, they explode in a glorious fireball of corroding acid and hull piecing shards. Biggest among these bursting balls is the meiotic spore. This is basically a meaty ball sack filled to the brim with various spore mines, all tied together by a bunch of groping tentacles that swaffle across the ground. The moment these evil dead-like fun sticks touch something, they will quickly wrap around the target and hold them in place. The meiotic spore will then explode and cover the unwilling Bukake victim in a shower of acid, chitin shards and xenoforms. But alas, for the Emperor's Children players, this and the next entry are no longer tabletop relevant. Regardless, being an ex-Zerg main, I of course do still have to talk about the mycetic spores. These fleshy drop pods are the Tyranid equivalent of Dreadclaws and Deadstorms. Tyranid Voidcraft will hover above orbit and shoot a torrent of these down onto the planet below. Upon impacting, each of these pods will crack open like a Pokeball and reveal a bunch of Tyranid bioforms. Of course, outside of the mass deployment option, you could also see these beings used to stealthily deliver a handful of lictors into the enemy backline or to seed some gene stealers on an unexpected hive city. With the most important spores covered, let's talk about everyone's favorite space doggo, the adorable Gaunt. Starting off with the Hormagond, because it looks like a Zergling. Shame they don't have wings or I finally could have fulfilled my dream of having a miniature Zerg army. 
Anyways, these side-wheeling velociraptors are used as the bulk of the Tyranid army. Billions of these will be sent out in massive strikes that can best be described as a locust swarm. Except that every locust is as big as you are, and you are the corn in this scenario. Gifted with extremely thick ties, Hormagons run with a surprising amount of speed and are capable of jumping over almost any obstacle. Their entire body is constructed to get into melee as fast as possible, where they will use their siding talons to turn you into minced meat. What makes them rather special, however, is that unlike most nit creatures, these Gons are 100% independent creatures. This allows them to survive and thrive on their own, even when losing synapse. They can hunt, they can eat, they can fuck, they can breed and everything. This makes them ideal for seeding rural planets, as the hive mind can simply leech them back in whenever they have become widespread enough. Meanwhile, their lack of synapse makes them hard to detect by psychic means before the Tyranid hive mind arrives. This all is a crucial difference they have when compared to the Termagant. This bioform has a similar body construct, but is instead upgraded with a symbiotic biomorph, which it uses as a weapon. There's quite some variety between these organisms and I won't cover all, but to give a couple examples, there is the flesh borer, a wasp nest filled with flesh hungry beetles that can eat through ceramite. There's the strangle web, basically a hot glue gun that shoots quickly hardening spider webs. And of course the good old spine fist, basically a pistol that shoots bone shards. The biomorphs provide the Gons with some much needed firepower and range, while the fact that they consist out of two creatures allows the hive mind to quickly create the right combination for every situation. This results in the Termagant being a solid all-round infantry creature, which the hive mind usually utilizes in overwhelming numbers. Interestingly enough, when they lose synapse they quickly turn into very cowardly creatures and hide away until they eventually die of starvation. That being said, this can also be an upside as plenty of unsuspecting Imperials have met their demise when they stumbled upon a hiding Termagant. Of course, your life as a Guardsman could always get worse and thus the hive mind has also created winged versions of the Termagons called Gargoyles. Gargoyles have switched out their muscular legs and talons of the conventional Gaunt frame in exchange for a light, rubbery body with wings. Their main purpose is to sow confusion amongst enemies by utilizing and worsening the chaos of combat. First of all, the concept of agile flyers that shoot down all-consuming carnage beetles from their flesh borer guns is already kinda fucked up. Worse is the fact that they scream hard enough to make your ears bleed and that they spit sticky venom at people. Imagine that Dilophosaurus scene from Jurassic Park, but then from the air. And there's hundreds of them. But what really makes them an absolute menace is that they lack any hard body parts. And this allows them to slip through almost any hole you're really going to regret having a ventilation shaft when gargoyles show up into your command center and plenty of larger aircraft has been infected with gargoyles after flying through a knit combat zone. For all their powers, their weak frame does leave them with one major downside and that is that they don't have enough muscles and fat reserves to fly for prolonged periods of time. You'd be usually disappointed if you did a pigeon race with a gargoyle, not to mention you'd probably also be eaten of course. Jokes aside, these gargoyles are usually accompanied by larger winged creatures on which they can latch for a while to rest their wings, but we will get to those later. First, we ought to take a look at the heavy weapons variant of the Gaunt, the Barb Gaunt. Unlike what we saw with the Termagons, where the weapon had formed a symbiotic relationship with its host, the Barb Launcher Biomorph actually just takes control of the Gaunt carrier. These Gaunts have basically been turned into servitors that drag the Barb Launcher towards wherever it wants to go. In the Tyranid Horde, the Barb Gaunts fill the hole between the front line and the entrenched artillery backline, close enough to inflict maximal carnage, but far enough away from the violence to prevent harm coming to the, well, the Barb Launcher, if we're being honest. From this position, they fire big blobs of biomass that will damage and bog down the enemy. Neurogons, meanwhile, also suffer from a parasitic infection, but fulfill a more logistical role. They act as a transport creature to move the psychically gifted neurocytes around the battlefield. These heavily armored parasites will start to grow into the neural tissue of the Gaunt, and similar to the Barb Launcher, they will direct the Gaunt to the position from which, well, they would be most useful. The neurocytes then act as a relay station for the synaptic link between the Tyranid forces, making sure that no gaps start to fall within the Horde, as this would be a major disruption in the hive mind's tactics. Particularly gifted neurogons will start to swell with psychic neural tissue and turn into a node beast, which is basically just a stronger version of the neurogont, in other words, a primaris neurogont. 
With the guns done, we're going on a bit of a detour as there are still some pants grabbers that are formerly part of the Tyranid Codex. Now I'm not going to cover these in detail as they kinda deserve their own set of videos, but in short. Gene Stealers are weird looking humanoid Tyranids that come in various stages of being more or less humanoid. Some later stages look and operate basically like a human with some quirky traits, while the pure strains we see in the Tyranid army are only human in the fact that they are bipedal. Being able to infect and breed with humans, they infect Imperial worlds and slowly spread the Tyranid genome via cults. These cults will facilitate further spread via propaganda, mind control, assassination and so on and so forth. These cults also emit a psychic beacon that draws the hive mind's forces towards the planet. Once the planet is softened up enough and the infection is running rampant, the hive mind will send its forces for a final revolution to conquer and consume the planet. In your Tyranid army you can include these pure strain gene stealers, which are the 5th generation warrior strain iterations of the gene stealer life cycle. They are greatly feared amongst Imperial armies for their special claws. For some reason these are so sharp that they can cut through even terminator plate like a knife through butter. Effectively they render armor useless and thus are the weapon of choice against heavily armored forces such as space marines. A special variant of the pure strain is the Imgaral gene stealer. These formed out of a splinter from high fleet behemoth that got lost a couple centuries ago. During their exile they developed special camouflage and shapeshifting abilities that turned them into a real Lovecraftian horror monster. Leading the squads of these Penty borrowers we find the good old Broodlord. Whenever a lone gene stealer finds itself in foreign territory it will grow in power and become a Broodlord, gaining much higher levels of intelligence as well as becoming a miniature hive mind that extends synaptic control through the gene stealer cult. It will then start to infect people to start off the aforementioned cult spreading procedure until eventually the hive mind arrives and slaves their synapse to its own network. In terms of combat prowess, they are similar to the Gene Stealer Pure Strains with armor rending claws and great agility. Their real power, however, comes from their more tactical genius and their ability to single handedly ruin an entire hive planet when given enough time. And that's it. Yes, there are only two of these in the actual Tyranid range, but fortunately they got plenty of cool units in their own codex. Next up, we have a bunch of very typical Tyranid creatures that basically feature as the Space Marine and Terminator equivalents of the Hive Mind's Armada. Starting off with the classic Tyranid Warrior. Outside of Gons, these monsters make up the bulk of the Tyranid forces. Tyranid Warriors can employ a variety of weapons, including both melee and ranged biomorphs. And just like the Gons, the fact that they are composed of these separately grown weapon symbiotes allows for a very diverse range of weapons to be used. From the machine gun like Devourer, or Death Spither to the big boom blaster known as the Venom Cannon. In addition to being big and mean, Tyranid Warriors are also cunning tacticians that spread synaptic link around them. They will direct the lower forces around them similar to a general of more conventional forces, making sure that the forces are employed in the most effective ways possible. It's like in Starcraft where you want to make sure that you send your countering units against the units that they counter while keeping them away from the units that counter them. The Winged Tyranid Prime is one of the more recent additions to the Swarm coming into the galaxy via the dreaded Leviathan box set. The pinnacle of the Tyranid Warrior strain, these beasts have evolved wings as well as a greatly increased intelligence. Soaring through the skies above the battlefield, they are able to observe the theater of war with a bird's eye view, striking down to fight where assistance is needed or swooping up high priority targets. In addition, this top view provides them with a lot of information on how best to proceed the warfare. So while fighting, they will constantly send Synapse instructions to the other Tyranids on how to proceed, literally adapting strategies on the fly, if you'll excuse the pun. The Ravener Brood is a special strain of these Tyranid warriors specialized in scaring the fuck out of people. Instead of simply walking up to the enemy, the Raveners burrow beneath the earth and pop out from underneath the enemy's feet. While not being able to spread synapse or to utilize complex military tactics, these snaky boys have instead traded all their brain space for sensory organs. As a result, Raveners can detect even the slightest noises made on the surface above. Allegedly, it was originally believed that they could only detect movement, but this was disproved by the Adeptus Mechanicus. When ambushed by Raveners, one of their commanders ordered all troops to seize movement in order to make themselves invisible to their detection methods. But after all of them were brutally murdered, the Mechanicus concluded that there's probably a bit more to their sensory organs than initially expected. 
Standing on rock to avoid their burrowing also won't work. Their digging talons must be covered in some special acid, as they are capable of chopping through even solid bedrock. I wouldn't even consider yourself safe inside a building or a tank, to be honest. While it is currently believed to have died with the breaking of High Fleet Kraken, there used to be a special variant strain of the Ravener brood called the Red Terror. And yes, this is a euphemistic way of me saying that the model got canned during the Great Purge of 9th edition. Hypothesized to be a prototype of the Moloch or the Trigon strains, we will cover those later, this murderous horror slasher was encountered upon Devlon Primus. For almost a month, this creature would borrow its way into the fortress city. Every day it would appear out of the ground, kill dozens of soldiers and disappear into the slimy dark tunnels it left in its wake. After being ganged by Rek'Sai frequently enough, the Imperials decided to send dedicated kill squads down the tunnels to hunt her down. But just as what usually happens when you send an AD carry to kill a fat Rek'Sai, they were never seen again. After these attacks, the Red Terror has never appeared again in Imperial records, but it should be noted that the planet to which the refugee ship from Devlin Prime fled has gone completely dark. No human lives on its surface anymore and no one knows how that happened. Cannon fodder has never looked scarier than the Tyrant Guard. These chunky boys are specialized simply in soaking up all the weapons fire that is coming the way of whatever they are charged with protecting. Huge slabs of bulking muscle covered with massive plays of dense chitin makes it so that they excel at this job. But to really spice them up, the Norn Queens have actually taken space marine biomatter to create these alien meat shields. They are blind, so they have to be directed via synapse by other Tyranids, but as a trade-off they are also practically immune to pain and can shrug off almost every wound. Like a creature from Evil Dead, you're going to have to turn them into tiny pieces before they will stop moving. In a battle, they will follow around important Tyranid leaders, such as Hive Tyrants, to discourage enemies from performing any decapitation strikes. After all, removing their leaders and synapse is one of the few reliable ways to weaken a Tyranid force. Interestingly enough, they are also gifted with massive adrenal glands that will fire if the creature they are tasked with protecting ever would die. Upon this event, they will turn into vicious brutes that smash anything in the near vicinity into pulp. I mean, the Codex says that this is to kill whatever just figured out how to kill an important Tyranid bioform, but it's kind of more funny to just imagine that they're throwing a hissy fit. Anyways, when the battle is well underway, the hive mind will also start to deploy and grow a variety of infrastructure upon the dying planet. This, however, is a massive investment of biomass, and thus it is of crucial importance that it is not destroyed. In order to make sure of this, the Hive Guard was created. Hive Guards are a special adaptation of the Tyrant Guard and patrol reclamation pools, spawning areas, or whatever else the hive mind wants to keep safe. As a result of this, they are rarely seen on the actual battlefield since their role simply lies elsewhere. Similar to the Tyrant Guard, these creatures are blind, but in order to see where they shoot, the Hive Guard instead see the world through a synaptic form of telepathy. They can share the vision of all the bioforms around them, which allows them to have an almost perfect 360 degree field of vision. In other words, they get to play with a minimap. When an enemy is spotted, they will fire a little thingy the Imperials call the Impaler Cannon. This bad boy shoots 2 meter long jagged spikes and if that wasn't enough, the guard can actually redirect them mid-air to act as honing missiles. If you are visible to any Tyranid bioform, these creatures can and will shoot you, with their spiky javelins simply curving around cover if needed. Upping the size a little bit more, we find the Carnifex. Basically, to the Tyranid warrior, what a warrior is to a gaunt. Carnifexes come in a wide variety of forms, but all of them are big, towering brutes capable of kicking a tank on its side. Whenever the Nids need some brute force to break through a fortification, to crush the insides of a spaceship, or to break the line, they send in a Carnifex. These balls of death are too big and tanky to be taken down by conventional weaponry and thus run at the enemy with reckless abandon. Similar to many other Tyranid strains, the Carnifexes are adapted specifically for each purpose and thus there are too many Carnifex variants out there to cover here, but I will go over some of the more common ones. The most classic Carnifex and the one that recently got its own special new model is the so-called Screamer Killer. This bad boy is equipped with four massive sighting talons and is basically a very angry Ultralisk. But that is not where the fun stops. In addition to these claws, the Screamer Killer can vomit up massive balls of plasma that can melt through a dreadnought. When preparing one of these volleys, the energy charge starts to emit a horrifying screeching noise. 
I don't think I need to explain further how this guy got its name. Another common one is the thorn back. These carnifexes have mutated to grow rows of chitin spikes on their backs as well as thorny protrusions on their skin. Their role is to break through lines of infantry, which they will usually accomplish by literally charging into them like jumping into a ball pit. Upon impact, their spikes excel at latching onto enemies and tearing them along. Furthermore, their backs are often filled with spine bangs. When coming near an enemy, these will pop and shoot out a volley of poisonous needles. Whatever is still left standing then, will be gunned down by close range dead spitter or devourer fire. The bile beast is the polar opposite and specializes in anti-armor. Equipped with a heavily adapted digestive system, bile beasts will literally vomit all over their enemy, coating them in a heavily acidic, corrosive fluid that turns metal to butter. After softening up their prey, they will then use their crab claws to dismantle the construct piece by piece. Because nids never do anything with a half measure, they also act as a hive for corrosive fungi that constantly gush their spores from the holes in the carnifex back. But by far the best carnifex of all time is the stone crusher. Not giving two shits about being tactical or using some wicked spores, this carnifex has put all its points in getting heavy armor and a colossal massive bone club. It uses this thing to smash tanks into the ground or to smash apart buildings while doing its best Godzilla impression. High Fleet Behemoth used to specialize in these things and would send them charging face first into walls. After ramming half into a building, they would then use their massive muscular legs to pull out. All the while, the hooked curves of their armor would make sure to tear down whatever building they had just forcefully penetrated. Like the Reveners, Carnifexes too have one special character named Old One-Eye. This special Carnifex is easily recognizable by the fact that it is a pirate. Somehow the lack of his right eye gives him superpowers as Old One-Eye is seemingly indestructible, capable of surviving mortal blows and magically resurrecting upon death. But that's not how it began. During the destruction of Kalth, or well, one of the destructions of Kalth, that planet really can't catch a break, the Ultrasmurs were faced by one massive Carnifex that constantly broke their lines, barging through tanks, dreadnoughts, terminators and whatever else they threw at it. Only when one of them jumped on its head and literally rammed an overcharging plasma pistol in its eye socket, did it drop dead. All but forgotten, it was later found in a block of ice and it soon restarted its rampage after being taught. Until the arrival of High Fleet Leviathan, this monster routinely brought death and destruction to various worlds around Ultramar, always reappearing, regrowing wounds faster than they could be dealt, but seemingly never regrowing the old wound that put it down. Mass regeneration has since been incorporated into many more Carnifexes by High Fleet Leviathan, which somewhat reduces the uniqueness of him, but the gene stealers still consider him almost like a patron saint. There is even a group called the Behemoth Undercold that cuts out the eyes of its members in an act of devotion to their favorite mythological creature. But hey, I can hear you think, Bart, what the fuck, aren't Tyranids supposed to be some Lovecraftian Cthulhu horror shit? Oh yeah, and we're about to get there, cause it's time for the creepy crawly Lictor category. Lictors are basically the hive mind spec ops. They are the monster hiding in the basement, the thing that stalks at night, and the thing a night lord checks the underside of his bed for. Lictors are clad in the best cameo gear known in the galaxy, capable of blending into the environment so well they might as well be invisible. They can furthermore drop their body temperature like a hummingbird, so even heat detection proves useless against them. They can climb walls, run fast as fuck, and remain perfectly still for weeks. Lictors are so hard to detect that the Imperial Protocol for finding them is something called Reconnaissance by Fire. Basically, you shoot everything you have the moment you get a glimpse of one of them and just hope for the best. That's not necessarily what makes them so special though. No, 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 no. What really sets Lictors apart from the swarm is the fact that they operate outside of the hive mind synapse web. Lictors are sent all over the galaxy to act as scouts and infiltrants. This means that they are often far removed from other nids and thus the hive mind has given them a mind of their own. Lictors will then scout the planet to learn everything about its defenders and ecosystems, creating a psychic report of weaknesses, resources and plans of attack. To best do that however, they need your help. In order to learn quickly, Lictors will seek out isolated creatures or wait in the dark until someone passes by and then they will rapidly strike with their mantis claws, often outright killing someone before they can truly realize even what's happening. 
Their tentacles then burrow into their victim's brain and drain all of the information from it. This way, the death of a single soldier can spell the doom for an entire regiment, with all plans, tactics and locations suddenly known to this malignant devil. Neurolictors are a special mutated strain of lictors that specialize in infiltration and terror tactics. Instead of scouting new planets or learning about the enemy's plans, the Neurolictor just scares and confuses the crap out of them. Neurolictors have developed special mind control abilities that allow them to confuse enemies. It causes them to forget ever seeing a Neurolictor, which effectively renders itself invisible as people's brains just refuse to recognize its existence. Once it has inserted itself in a good position, it will then start to cause a creeping dread that will soon turn into a full-blown panic attack. It will start to reroute people's minds to be constantly scared, and as they start to make mistakes, they jump at their own shadow, then the real monsters of the swarm launch their attack. Of course, that psychic warp fuckery is all very confusing and that information gathering is kinda nerdy, but that's why we have the Dead Leaper. Dead Leapers also kinda specialize in breaking the mind of the enemy before battle, but they simply do so by murdering the ever-living shit out of everyone. They will infiltrate centers of operation and make sure to leave a body count as if they're trying to beat a high score. Every morning the soldiers will wake up to find their halls decorated in gore, all corpses devoid of brain matter. Unlike other lictors, Dead Leapers want people to know they're there and they want to know that they are coming for them. A good way to summarize it would be that Dead Leapers are like the Night Lords, lictors are like the Raven Guard, and Neurolictors are like the Alpha Legion. A particular asshole of a Dead Leaper haunted the Sin Caspalan Fortress. It would go on a brutal rampage every night, butchering all soldiers guarding the planet's leader, barging into his chamber, murdering his servants, and then retreating. Needless to say that when the High Fleet arrived, the planetary leader was a little more than a husk, completely unfit to lead the defense. Of course, hunting in numbers is of course also an option, so let me introduce you to the Von Ryan's Leaper. Now who is Von Ryan, you ask? Well, no one knows, but he's probably dead considering his field of research. VRLs are basically a crossbreed between a Lictor and a Hormagond. Similar to Gons, they hunt in packs and chop apart enemies in melee with massive sharp claws. But unlike Gons, they are smarter, possess camouflage powers and excel at setting up ambushes. I'll be honest with you, the 10th edition codex is garbage at lore, so that's unfortunately all I know about them. Venom tropes are what happens when you let the hive mind watch Nurgle troops for too long. On their backs you will find two rows of massive chimneys that constantly vomit forth spore clouds of venomous fungi. Everything touched by these spores will rapidly overgrow with fungi and decompose into a poisonous sludge. This is all part of the plan as they slowly turn the area of invasion more and more lethal to non-tyrannic life, very similar to the miasmic malignifier of the Dead Guard. Also similar to Nurgle, they are way more friendly than you would like them to be. See, they use these tentacles not just to hentai you six feet under, but also to drag people into their poisonous spore clouds. Here they rapidly decompose until they are flimsy enough to be eaten. Oh yeah, and they operate in large packs to make sure the concentration of spores and poisons is as high as possible. Making sure prey is covered in so much muck they'll die before they can retaliate. First discovered on the planet of Mortex, the parasite of Mortex is a living ripper swarm dispenser. Their tail ends in a barbed stinger that surrounds a hollow tube which is basically an ovipositor. Making the most out of their agile winged body, they conduct shock assaults on enemies and quickly stab them with their stinger. Aiming to be long flown away again before they get shot down. Meanwhile the victims have been filled with a couple dozen ripper babies. Like a xenomorph, they will quickly eat their victim from the inside and burst from them in a spray of gore. In this way, the parasites can turn a fortified trench into a ripper-filled hellhole in one fell swoop. All that remains of Mortex now is a single astropodic message warning others of the coming of this parasite. Another type of horror comes from the Eldari blood-based zoanthropes. These tyranids are almost 100% brain matter to better facilitate their impressive psychic strength. The hive mind has taken much inspiration from the biology of the Eldar to create these creatures. Zoanthropes are able to tap into the hive mind's shadow to draw out power similar to how a psyker would tap into the warp. 
Most important of all, this allows them to hover above the ground to assert dominance. But it also allows them to shoot balls of magic, infuse nearby tyranids, create psychic force fields and mind crush people like in the Japanese version of Yu-Gi-Oh. This makes them a very powerful and versatile addition to the swarm. I mean, there's a reason why almost every race outside of the Necrons utilizes psychers of some kind. With zoanthropes, the hive mind cannot just cut psychers off from the warp, but also give them a taste of their own medicine. Despite all that, they have one massive flaw, and that is that the Elder DNA does not seem to mash perfectly with that of the Tyranids. Zoanthropes have been reported to spontaneously explode in a spray of blood and brain matter, with heavy use of their powers increasing the chances of such grim fireworks. One particularly wicked zoanthrope is the Doom of Malantai, a beast so dangerous, tales of this creature are still told to make young Eldari go back to bed. In short, this zoanthrope had mutated the ability to eat souls in order to boost its psychic might. The Eldari, as you might know, store the souls of their deceased in a little magic box called an Infinity Circuit. Well, this one turned out to be pretty finite as the Doom of Melantai drank it dry. This then caused it to swell to a godly level of power with which it obliterated and ate every single life form on the craft world of Melantai. Where it is now, however, no one knows. The hive mind, however, took some learnings from this formidable monstrosity and created the Neurotrope. This is basically just an improved version of the Zoanthrope that has gained a fraction of the soul-leeching potential of the Doom of Malantai. Unlike the Doom, however, these creatures do not get to collect infinite soul stacks to create a new event horizon, they instead get the power to heal themselves and Zoanthropes near them. This psychic triage may sound trivial at first, considering the psychic shielding employed by these brain bugs, However, it also soothes their warp connection, which reduces the chances of them meeting an, well, let's call it an explosive end. With the neurotropes done, we have reached the end of the creepy crawlies, and in this time we start talking about the real abominations. The wide array of big dick monsters the hive mind has dreamed up, for which you'll probably want to call in some knights. A theme which you will often find within the Tyranids is that for every creature, there is always another creature that does the same, but better. Bigger, better, stronger, faster. This allows the hive mind to select the perfect tool for each job without having to waste copious amounts of tyrannic biomass and building titans for each battle. A perfect example of this is the Maliceptor, which is a psyker specialized in blowing shit up via magic, very similar to the zoanthropes. The hive mind, however, wanted to have some more destructive power, and thus he increased the brain capacity of this creature to the point where it can 1v1 a squad of terminators. It does this by channeling the shadow in the warp to summon a destructive array of shadow tentacles that smash and crush everything in the near vicinity. Since the bulk of its brain has become literally too much of a hustle to carry in the air via magic, the hive mind also created a heavily armored muscular frame. This way the creature can focus all of its psychic might on destroying things without having to worry about shields or flying. And it is literally blind destruction in this case because the Maliceptor lacks any form of eyesight. Instead it operates via synaptic instructions similar to the Hiveguard. The Neurotyrant meanwhile went the complete opposite evolutionary direction and instead became even more of a big brain mind fuckery thing. The Neurotyrant acts as a massive amplification beacon for the Shadow in the Warp. Enemies, especially psychically attuned ones, will already feel a sense of dread and discomfort because of this shadow, even without a neuro tyrant nearby. But its presence will increase the psychic torment felt by the enemies in an attempt to drive them insane or to make them flee the battlefield. By focusing the amplified shadow on one or two targets in specific, it can even create such a strong sense of cosmic dread that it can literally melt the brain of enemy combatants. The other role it fulfills is to act as a mobile command center that sends directives from the hive mind directly to the brains of the Tyranids via Synapse. To this end it also uses these adorable little squid boys. The Tyrant just sends the command to these cuddle balls and they spread it around to nearby Tyranids, increasing the resolve and tactical awareness of the Tyrannic Horde as a whole. As every nit player will tell you, you can never have enough guns and thus the Norn Queens have blessed us with the Turvagon. Turvagons have a massive breeding sack attached to them that will constantly grow and spawn termagons. Conventionally, you will not see these in combat very much as they are more of a breeding organism meant to keep up with the likely high rates of termagon attrition. They will instead stay on the bioships and provide a constant stream of fresh warriors. 
That is not to say that they are not capable of combat though, these guys are still capable of tearing you apart with their claws, or alternatively they can just spawn a small horde of minions to fight for them. During void travel, most nids try to get some respite from the endless wars and feeding frenzies and thus enter a deep form of hibernation. Not the Turvagons, however. They patrol the halls of the bioship looking for intruders, similar to how a white blood cell patrols your body for pathogens. If it finds any, it will first of all release a burst of gons to pin them down, which are basically the antibodies in this analogy. Then it will use a special synapse organ to send out a warning pulse to the ship, again similar to how a white blood cell can release cytokines. Upon receiving this cytokine synapse signal, the ship can then wake up the troops, spelling doom for the unfortunate boarders. The alternative building option for this kit is the Tyrannofax, which unlike the Turvagon definitely is a combat beast. If the hive mind really wants one enemy in particular to fuck off and they prefer to remove them from range, they send in this thing. The Tyrannofax is an enormous tank clad in multiple layers of chitin armor plates that make it immune to small weapon fire. Its melee power isn't great, but it will release pheromones when attacked that will attract nearby Tyranids to come and help a buddy out. They also have a stinger array that will fire sharp bolts at nearby enemies, similar to the stingers of a porcupine. However, more importantly, it carries one of the biggest guns found in all of the hive, namely a biocannon, and these can come in three variants. The flesh borer hive variant works similar to the smaller flesh borer rifles. It is a hive of carnivorous borer beetles that are shot out at the enemy. Upon contact, they will start to bite and chew through whatever they come into contact with. And funnily enough, the Tyrannofax actually has to fire this thing regularly, as it will otherwise start to build up too many borer beetles. And if this happens, the Tyrannofax will actually explode as beetles start to fire off in the hive, causing a bit of a chain reaction. On the other hand, the Rupture Cannon variant is a special anti-armor weapon with lore that, to be honest, makes little sense. With every shot, it fires two bullets. One is a sack of oil that will burst and coat the target in a nice layer of oil. After being oiled up, they are then hit by the second bullet, which is apparently a seed pot that ignites the oil, but rather than combusting, the oil magically starts to propel inwards, which causes the target to implode. Whatever, the model looks really cool. And finally, there is Acid Spray, and I don't think I have to explain this one much further. This one has a sack with digestive juices, basically a stomach to go. This is then attached to an oversized super soaker that it uses to blow acid over anything in the near vicinity. Hey, you remember spore mines from the start of this video? Well, the Biovore gladly delivers them to the enemies of insect kind. Covered by some thick layers of chitin, its torso features a spore mine birthing chamber that produces this ammunition. To prevent the knockback from toppling him over, the biovore will furthermore dig its claws into the earth before firing, like a siege tank from Starcraft. It then uses gas buildup to propel spore mines into the air via the massive phallic-shaped cannon on its back. Fun fact, in some older material it is hinted that they might actually be based on org DNA. After all, they are specialized in rapidly growing spores. I personally doubt this is still canon however, as the new model no longer looks like a Tyranid orc, but instead looks more like a beetle. Anyways, the kit can also be built as a pyrovore. Pyrovores themselves are complete idiots, with less spatial awareness than a pig. Like a zombie, they only know hunger and will do nothing but forage for food. Like a pig, however, they are really good at rooting out the best pieces of food and that is why the hive mind uses them like truffle seekers. Armed with strong mandibles and a highly corrosive boiling saliva, pyrovores can eat anything from armor to rock. They therefore specialize in finding rare minerals or metals that the hive mind needs to build its more specialized troops. Using their stone melting drool, they will extract these and bring them back to the hive mind. In other words, these guys are a Necron's worst nightmare, as the tomb world is nothing but rare materials. Okay, but what about the big gun, you ask? Well, since the Pyrovore is such an absolute mongrel, the gun actually is a separate bioform with a brain much bigger than that of the Pyrovore. This gun keeps the hungry gorilla safe by shooting gouts of tyrannic napalm at whatever dares to get close to its host. And if that wasn't enough discouragement to get in its way, pyrovores will also explode if killed, not only spraying their boiling digestive juices all over the place, but also covering you in their blood, which is as corrosive as that of a xenomorph. 
Talking about big stupid artillery beasts, meet the Exocrine. Where the Pyrovore was stupid, this creature simply has no actual brain. Instead the massive cannon on its back does all the thinking for it, but now comes the hilarious part, the gun isn't all that great in the mental department either. As a result, this creature can only fire while standing still because there is not enough brain capacity to think about moving and shooting at the same time. That is where the fun stops though, because this thing packs heat like it's nobody's business. This is a bioplasmic cannon, which is simply put, six plasma cannons mounted together. Armed with six eyes for optimal targeting, it rarely misses, and with the highly adapted Tyranid metabolism, it also doesn't explode as much as the Imperial variants. In addition, the heat from these bolts will weaken armor and melt servos, which makes it easier for melee Tyranids to finish off whatever is still standing after a salvo. The alternative build for the Exocrine is the much dreaded Haru Spex, uh, which is also known as the Horrible Hentai Hamster. This creature is more mouth than anything else, and unsurprisingly it specializes in eating biomass faster than an ogre in an eating contest. It is armed first of all with a barbed tentacle tongue that will shoot out, grab an enemy and pull it towards its enormous mouth. If it is too big to be grabbed in its entirety, the first two sets of teeth will start to tear off something that's a bit more bite sized, and if it is space marine size or smaller, these sets will instead hold the food in place, while the third set of jaws will grind the prey to mush like a wood chipper. Accompanying a spray of blood, bile and gore, this allows for the decomposition of an entire space marine in the blink of an eye. The Harrowspex's eating behavior is in fact so gruesome and so lacking in table manners that it forces nearby enemies to make a battle shock test on tabletop. In order to keep up with its rapid metabolism, the Harrowspex has also evolved a series of steam vents on its back. It then uses water cooling to keep its innards at an acceptable temperature, while tons of biomass are degraded into raw molecules with record speed. Talking about hentai monsters, here is a Toxicrine, a creature with so many tentacles, people literally dislike using it because it is just too bulky to do anything with. Can't transport it, can't place it near troops and can't move it past battlefield terrain. Fortunately, it is even more horrible in-universe. Primarily, Toxicrines are like sensors that shroud the battlefield in extremely dangerous spore clouds. Upon entering any moisture, these spores soak up the liquid and start to multiply, rapidly increasing in size as they do. In practice, this does not just mean that lakes and pools start to become covered in fungi. Oh no, if these get in someone's mouth, nose or lungs, they will also do this, causing people to suffocate on a mixture of spores and blood. Even if you're wearing respiratory protection, the spores will just start to grow on the moisture inside of the filters, clogging them and forcing you to either take them off or to choke on your own breath. Many enemies tend to run away as they start to notice this phenomenon, so the Norn Queens have in their infinite wisdom granted the Toxicrine a set of tentacles. This will keep enemies in place long enough for the fungi to do their work, or of course to just simply lash out and smash infantry to pulp. I mean, after all, it is a 20 meter long muscular tentacle whip. High Fleet Gorgon especially was known for its heavy usage of Toxicrines and Venom tropes. In a scorched earth fashion, these would completely ruin the environment of every area they passed, making it impossible for troops to approach, let alone recapture territory. The magical Psyker equivalent of the Toxicrine is the Psychophage. This guy's entire shtick is to make a beeline towards enemy Psykers. It has developed special burrowing tentacles that rip out the brain of a Psyker with lightning speed. This often allows them to kill the Psyker before they can finish casting their spells. After eating Psyker tissue, it then uses this to produce special Psycho-reactive ash clouds. It shoots these out of the chimneys on its back, like a Lovecraftian camera up, and these magic clouds will fly past cover to seek out and burn other enemies alive, giving them a taste of their own Psyker. The Moloch is the big brother of the Ravener. So big in fact that it specializes in swallowing you whole. This is a blind brute that is built like a mining drill and it will speed through the soil beneath enemy forces with rapid speed. Upon detecting vibrations coming from the ground above, it will shoot out of the ground in an eruption of stone and teeth. It will then simply eat whatever is nearby and it will even unlock its jaws like a snake in case the prey is as fat as your mama. The alternative build for the Moloch is the Trigon. Similar to the Moloch, it burrows underground and detects vibrations to sense its prey, 
Upon detecting prey, it will shoot out from the ground and use its massive claws to rend the unsuspecting enemies apart. But unlike the Moloch, their armor also uses the friction of their rapid digging to charge electricity, which the Trigon can discharge on command like an eel. By spewing conductive gases from its gills, it can then send literal lightning bolts towards its enemies, in a combo very reminiscent of the Zippelbacks from How to Train Your Dragon. Back to the point, they can also team up with a group of Trigons to create a true crescendo of lightning. This so-called Bioshock brood is heralded by a taste of ozone and vox crackles and it will literally make your hair stand on end. Emergence of the brood will unleash a tempest that would make even Raiden blush. In a similar vein, there is also the Trigon Prime, which features special containment spikes to increase the amount of volts it can store. But it gets so much worse, because unlike the Moloch, killing isn't even its primary purpose. The main purpose of this beast is setting up a complex network of tunnels. It creates this alien infrastructure by coating the tunnels it digs in a crystallizing mucus. This will harden instantly and allow for other Tyranids to traverse through the same tunnel. Oh yeah, and they also make deadfall traps this way, because you weren't dying fast enough yet. But enough about the things that crawl underneath your bed, because the Nids also got some flying bugs. The one you maybe gotta look out for the most is the Hive Crone, which is basically a Xenos fighter jet. Specialized in anti-air combat, they are fitted with hives of living EMP missiles called tentaclets. All the crones need to do is get close enough and these tentaclets will fly after the aircraft like guided missiles. Upon a collision, they then unleash a shock blast that will fry the equipment, causing massive damage to most airborne machines. A feature they do not just use during combat on planets, because these crones also act as interceptors during void combat. Here they fly alongside spacecraft with such high velocities that their razor-sharp chest spikes can literally titanic void ships by tearing gashes through their hull. Crones are nasty though, because when the enemy aircraft has been taken down, they start to utilize the drool cannon. You could probably guess it, but they start to shoot vomit over the ground troops to dissolve them into goo, which is just really disgusting. Anyways, amongst the flock of crones and gargoyles, you will also find harpies. The reason for this is that the harpies are completely front-loaded on damage, with their only real defense being not getting hit. To do so, they have evolved hollow bones, foamy chitin and air-filled body cavities. This makes them fast as fuck boy and allows them to outmaneuver almost any airborne foe, but they will basically die if you sneeze in their general direction. The only option they have when in danger is to sneeze back by utilizing their scream attack. This scream is the reason why they are called harpies and it acts as a sonic weapon that will make you bleed out of your ears as your eardrums explode. When left to their own device, however, they will rain down the fury of the Star God. Their belly is a storage sack filled with spore mines that they can drop during bombardment runs, causing a cascade of explosions amongst the troops on the ground. Their arms have been fitted with heavy venom or strangle-torn cannons big dick cannons that are even powerful enough to be used during void combat, and harpies will then fly over in fast strafing runs, dealing death before anyone has the opportunity to shoot back. When a Norn Queen really wants to kill someone in particular, they send out the Norn Emissaries and Assimilators. The Norn Emissary is massive when compared to other sneaky beasts such as the Lictors, Yet despite this, they can pass through cracks much smaller than themselves and move with a surprising lack of sound. Furthermore, they are equipped with a magical compass. Like how a pigeon can always find their home, Norn emissaries can almost always find the location of their target via psychological traces. When reaching their prey, they quickly drop the stealth and go in with an overwhelming display of power. Their size and talons allow them to outmuscle even custodies, and if that isn't enough, they also possess psychic powers. Altogether, this makes them into an apex predator that will keep on coming until their target reaches its inevitable demise. The Norn Assimilator, meanwhile, is very similar, except for the fact that they lack the psychic abilities of the Emissary. They have instead put all their skill points in combat power and bought a set of harpoons. No need to sneak up to your prey where you can just pull them towards you instead, I guess. But we have yet to speak about the most crucial organism in the Tyranid roster, the one beast that directs the entire horde on the battlefield, a commander and a battle tank in one, the Hive Tyrant. Conventionally, Tyranid creatures are rarely directed by the hive mind directly. Other synaptic Tyranids send out orders and the chaff follows. The Hive Tyrant, however, is the exception. 
Hive Tyrants are gifted with an actual self-aware mind that is on a direct Discord call with the Hive Mind. It is their task to turn the Hive Mind's directives into reality and they do so with utmost cunning. This direct link is not just for tactical reasons either though. No, 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 it gives them magical powers. Hive Tyrants can unleash psychic assaults against enemies, break morale by utilizing the shadow in the warp, or send reinvigorating energy into nearby Tyranids. And when a Hive Tyrant meets its unfortunate demise, it simply just regrows in the Hive Fleet's burning chambers. It retains all memories and experiences from before its death and thus is practically immortal. Despite the fact that they are immortal, they still function as the most important commander on the field and thus quite some measures have been taken to prevent them from reconnecting to their god's Wi-Fi too often. For starters, they are covered in thick lines of Chitin's armor and they are bigger than a dreadnought. They are packing some proper heat with heavy venom cannons that shoot shards of crystallized toxin, bone swords that drain the life from their victims and more. They are given an honor guard of Tyrant Guard and with their tactical acumen you will rarely find them in a disadvantageous position. The Hive Mind has also created a winged variant called the Winged Hive Tyrant, showing that while it is highly gifted at genetics, the naming conventions could still use a bit of work. One particularly feared Hive Tyrant is the Nephilim King. This commander dislikes the swarming tactics so common within the Tyranid Swarm. Instead it leads a stampede of Biotitans and is supported by many of the special psychic creatures we just discussed. After this group split from High Fleet Behemoth, many foes have tried to take them down, but so far no one has been able to stop the court of the Nephilim King, and with how much firepower is concentrated within this single army, it is unlikely their crusades will be put to an end anytime soon. And of course there is also the much memed about Swarm Lord. This creature is supposed to be the smartest, most dangerous Hive Tyrant in existence. A legendary creature that is practically unkillable in combat and whose brain could outmatch Perturabo. Yet in reality this creature is the Tyranid equivalent of the Avatar of Cain. A creature almost exclusively used to show how strong another character is. I mean, Dante beat this guy in a fight for fuck's sake. Anyways, metadata aside, the Swarm Lord is a special upgraded version of the Hive Tyrant. It is smarter, more creative, and there is no creature better at micromanaging billions of Tyranid forces than the Swarm Lord. Unlike the Virgin Hive Tyrants, the Swarm Lord is equipped with Bone Sabers. These are much better than Bone Swords because they are made from magical material not found in the 40k universe. Don't ask me how, but this material can cut through anything like a power sword. It doesn't get damaged and it automatically parries enemy strikes. It is like the Vorpal Blade, Excalibur and the Anathema all merge into one and this fucker has four of them. So yeah, shitty portrayals aside, this creature should canonically be able to beat anything the Imperials can throw at it. Whenever an army is really struggling to win or when a combat is of particular importance, this creature will suddenly appear. No matter the high fleet or the location, it will just start to grow and emerge from the birding chambers and take command. Basically, it's a hive mind's way of saying, if you want something done properly, you should just do it yourself. Small break before we go to the really cool stuff though, because there are also a couple of balls we need to talk about, namely the Sporocyst and the Tyrannocyte. The Sporocyst is an alien supply depot. They are shot down from the bio ships and will partially burrow themselves into the soil when they land. Here they will start to extract minerals and biomass to produce vast quantities of predatory spores. From the vents on their backs, these spores will flow to seek out every consumable organic particle and microorganism nearby, turning it all into a disgusting snot that can be easily consumed by other tyranids. They furthermore produce minefields of spore mines and act as synapse amplifiers. Hive tyrants have even been known to set up a whole bunch of these to act as a communication relay to better steer the invasion. The Tyrannocide is a single-use air-to-ground transport ball. They are shot from the bioships into the atmosphere and upon collision with the ground they unleash their payload of Tyranid organisms. But they are not just a drop pod, because after delivering the troops they fly up again. They then hover above the battlefield like a blimp and use their dead spitters to drop corrosive maggot juice all over the place. Ok, with that out of the way, we have finally reached the biggest class of Tyranids. The Leviathans that can spell the doom of armies when unleashed. Creatures for which you'll probably want to call it an orbital assault. The Biotitans. Now the smallest Biotitan in the Tyranid roster is the Hyrodule. The melee variant of the Hyrodule is known as the Sighted Hyrodule 
And this bad boy is about twice the size of a Carnifex and padded in 30cm thick chitin armor. Altogether, this makes it very difficult to take down, except by very heavy weapons fire. Wielding four bone sides, it specializes in melee combat, and even has a special fungus growing in the cracks of his armor plates that will shoot mutagenic acid at nearby enemies. Either you will be torn apart by claws the size of a bus, or you will get covered in cancer juice. Not a great time either way. The other variant is known as the Barbed Tower Duel, which features two modifications. First of all, two sides are replaced with Barbed Strangler Biocannons. This turns it into a potent ranged combatant and is also the reason why it is called the Barbed Hyrodule. The second change is that the fungi found in the armor plates of the sighted Hyrodule have been removed. Instead, the plates of this creature are thicker and denser, simply providing it with more tankiness against the fire that will probably be focused on it. The Herodon is by far the largest flyer the Tyranids have ever deployed and to give you an idea, here is an image showing a small Herodon together with a harpy and a gargoyle. Because that is right, Herodons have a typical size which is represented by the model, but they can actually grow to much bigger sizes when the hive mind deems it useful. Similar to most titan sized creatures, it relies on super heavy armor and a leviathan sized body to stay alive. While its cannons and claws take care of anything that is dumb enough to be on the same planet as a Tyranid Bio-Titan. But outside of that, it actually serves a really interesting role. You remember how the gargoyles didn't store enough energy for prolonged flights? Well, in order to solve this problem, they actually grab onto the belly of Herodons and only let go once they are near the combat. This Broodmother feature is really cool and you can actually see a couple of gargoyles attached to the model in this image. Okay, but then it's time for the thing you've all been waiting for, the real final boss of the Tyranids, the Hierophant Bio-Titan. This is by far the largest, most destructive thing the Tyranids have deployed so far. It is so big, in fact, that outside of Titans or orbital weaponry, they are basically indestructible. Its entire body is coated with building-sized chitin plates that will grow back almost as fast as you can dent them. Getting underneath it might seem like a good idea at first to be out of the range of its massive biocannons, but its belly is filled with living tentacles. Every tentacle is a separate symbiote that loves nothing more than penetrating whatever unfortunate soul finds itself underneath the belly of the beast. This allows the Hierophant to fight infantry by simply walking over them as the tentacles will turn that area into a hentai origin of anime proportions. Furthermore, it is equipped with specialized poison organs that constantly pump out bursts of toxic spores. These will drift down from the armor plates to cover the ground beneath in a deadly corrosive mist. But we haven't even talked about the main weapons yet, that this was just a defensive part. No, no, Hierophants are commonly armed with a titan-sized dead spitter variant that shoots globs of toxic acid mixed with maggots that eat through almost anything. This is the typical loadout as it is effective against most targets. No matter whether it's large or small, heavily armored or made out of biomass, it also splashes around, making it somewhat more effective against hordes of infantry or vehicles. Norn Queens have been known to make specialized custom Hierophants with other weapons as well though, so they can be armed with almost anything you can imagine. I mean, holy shit, look at this, what a beast. Almost makes me want to start playing Tyranids. But with the Hierophant cover, that rounds out almost all of the Tyranids. Sure, I skipped some obscure 3rd edition references here and there, but this should give you a good idea of what options you have when you're building a Tyranid army. And before you start about to die Micron, it is no longer available and lore-wise it is just a somewhat larger Norn Emissary, so we're going to leave that for what it is. And if you made it so far, I would really like to thank you for sticking with me for what is probably the longest video I have ever made. It is also the last video of 2023, so I'd like to wish you all the best for 2024. Now if you liked the video and you would like to see what I'm up to next year, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. And then for the last time, have a nice evening, and don't forget your nightly prayers to Nagash.